tonight. Um, it's really an honor to be the last speaker of our series, and uh, I'm not sure how I got elected to do this, but um, be it so, I'm going to see if I can wrap up with a bang here. And I would really love to have your involvement tonight in terms of what we're going to talk about and what we're going to look at. But the first um, involvement is, who can, who can give me an idea of what it takes to keep the Grand Canyon Grand? Money. Money. What's that here? Water. Water. Us. Us. All of you volunteers. Yes. Getting rid of the vehicles and having buses. <laughs> right. Transportation. Green transportation. Yep. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Air. Passion. What? Clean what is the air. Clean air. Yes. Yes. Yeah, kind of imperative to be able to see it. Right. Good. Okay, so what it takes to keep the Grand Canyon grand. And that's really what I'm going to, to um, cover is the work that we do at Grand Canyon and what it takes to keep, keep it grand. And I took a shot at answering the question. And I think that it takes sound science, good stewardship, and the most important, a will to keep one of America's best ideas alive. Okay, how many of you are cooks? Anyone bake a souffle? You know how hard it is to bake a souffle? So when we look at it, it's a classic treat, but it brings some fear into the minds of chefs who, who take it on. And when I think about that, and I think about Keeping Grand Canyon grand, it's a lot like creating a souffle. And that there's a lot of fear in, in the idea that you might ruin it, you might not be able to uh, bake it just right. It takes a real delicate hand to um, blend in all of the ingredients to make it work. So when we think about that, when we look at the Grand Canyon, I think of it as being chefs and really baking something really important. So, in our division, Science and Resource Management, I think that um, we're able to really look at all the different aspects that go on in Grand Canyon. And we cover, in the division, um, these four areas. But you can see it's quite diverse. And so, um, when we look at just the natural resources of life, everything from air quality to the wildlife, and then we look at the social-cultural aspect, of the canyon, and that includes everything from uh, wilderness, how important is it to the visitor, to the archaeology, the historic preservation, and soundscape, and uh, thinking about what is silence at the Grand Canyon, how important is that? Um, in our leadership arena, we have tribal consultation, and um, that's very important in terms of those folks who came before us, and those that are look at the Grand Canyon as very important to their heritage and where they came from, and they have current practices at the Grand Canyon as well. We have 11 affiliated tribes that um, associate themselves with the Grand Canyon region. And then science information and education services, it's very important that all of the information that we collect, the science, the research, um, all aspects of, of the information we collect, we want to make sure it gets out and can be utilized. And more importantly, we want to make sure that it can aid in making uh, very important decisions and where we go next. So we have the museum collection, our research permits, our archives. Very important that we keep uh, the past and we understand how that has influenced decisions and takes us into the future. So I kind of think of us as, as uh, chefs helping to create this souffle. And then the recipes that we use are very important. And as you can see, I've listed quite a few here, and this isn't all of them that help guide our management. But the ones that are bold, I think, are the ones that are really the foundation for it, that help us in how we manage the resources and how uh, we make very important decisions. So when we look at those three, the, the MPS Organic Act is one of the most significant. Think about this, 1916 is when this was developed. This was prior to Grand Canyon National Park becoming established. 
And we look at it to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein in such a manner, by such a means, as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. That's quite a task, but when you think about back in the 1916, who had that kind of a vision? What were we looking for? And then now, how important is that when we look at um, today's society and the demands that we have on national parks and these resources? Then in 1978, the Redwoods Act really brought out, if you think about the span of time between 1916 and 1978, the Redwoods Act's purpose was to really bring back and emphasize what the, the founders of the Organic Act were really intending. So we look at the protection, management, and administration of these areas shall be conducted in light of the high public value and the integrity of the national parks system and shall not be exercised in degradation of the values and purpose. So you can kind of see in a um, in an evolution sense, as more and more people come in, into the scene and utilizing national parks, how important the Redwood Act was to really bring back the spirit of the Organic Act. And then in 2006, the revision of the, the NPS management policies. And um, I pulled this statement out because I think it is very strong and very important. The Secretary has an absolute duty an absolute duty, which is not to be compromised, to fulfill the mandate of the, of the NPS Organic Act of 1916. So you can kind of see that from 1916 to 2006. Pretty strong. Okay, so key ingredients for our souffle. I think it takes a mix of a little history, sprinkle in some science, add some management wisdom, and then carefully fold in a few challenges. So let's start with the history. So as you know, historic views. When you think about it, we have a tremendous amount of uh, evidence of how the Grand Canyon um, was visited and, um, and the views that existed, and some of the first photographs that they took. And think about the techniques that were used at that time, the cameras and the film. And, and, and then what I really like is, kind of how everyone's dressed and that came to the canyon. A lot of the pictures show some of the women always in dresses and they're out there with carriages and, and, and taking a look at the, at the views. So the Grand Canyon has been a, spe a spectacle for, for a long, long time for many people. And then we have our, our land. Do you know how old the um, El Tabar and the Hopi House? 1905. 1905, yep. <laughs> 103 years, pretty amazing, 104 this year, right? 104, yeah. And, uh, and then the Burr Camps, you want to know the age of that? Yeah, it's a pretty good. Where's Lisa? Lisa, how old? Is it 1906? I think it was, yeah, I think 1906. And the Burr Camps just, um, just closed down their business this last year, and the Burkamp Center is now a visitor center. And it honors the Burkamps and the family and their tradition from 1906 to the present. And the historic river explorers. So, anybody know what that fellow is carrying in terms of a fish? What fish that is? Pike minnow, yes. That's amazing. That, that fish existed at that time. And, um, and then anybody know what's happening up here with the boat on the river? Well, actually, that was the, the exploration going down and looking at the possibility of building a dam. So they were uh, coming down, and it's right down in the Marble Canyon area, the Marble Canyon site. So exploring um, the, the ability to, to, to put the dam in, right, in that area. And then the Neville's Expedition. Um, the historic river use, we have a lot of evidence of that. Um, and one of our um, main programs in historic boats is to uh, restore them, uh, just bring, bringing them back to the degree in which they exist right now. Not to replace them or, or change anything, but just to take them and try to preserve where they are right now. 